On February 18, 1847, a rescue party that was sent into the Sierra Nevada mountains came upon a frozen lake where they had been told they would find cabins full of trapped settlers. At first, all they saw were piles and piles of snow and presumed, quote, that all must have perished. But when the rescuers gave a shout, an emaciated woman, barely a skeleton, emerged from a snow-covered hole to ask, are you men from California or do you come from heaven? Finally, the lost Donner Party was found and their nightmare almost over. The Donner Party, like so many other Americans in the 1840s, had headed west to forge a new life. Many of the stories of these frontiersmen ended happily, while the stories of others ended with great tragedy, but few tragedies were as brutal as that of the Donner Party. To this day, nearly 200 years later, the Donner Party's torturous journey, and especially their desperate turn to cannibalism, casts a haunting shadow over the history of the American frontier. You're listening to History Uncovered, brought to you by the digital publisher All That's Interesting, where we explore the uncharted corners of the natural world and the world past. I'm All That's Interesting's co-founder, Kit Westneat. And I'm associate editor, Leah Silverman. Today we're venturing to the Sierra Nevada mountains in 1846, where the Donner Party infamously turned to cannibalism to stay alive. The Donner Party set off from Independence, Missouri on May 12, 1846. Led by two brothers, Jacob and George Donner, and an Irish businessman named James Reed, the party of 87 pioneers included men, women, and many young children. Each had their own reasons for heading west, but all hoped to fulfill the promise of manifest destiny beyond the Mississippi. By day one, however, they had already made a fatal mistake. The Donner Party simply left too late. Pioneers like them were supposed to follow a rigid schedule leaving in mid to late April to ensure that their pack animals had ample grass to eat during the journey before the coldest months arrived. Leaving any later than mid-April meant risking that they'd still be traveling come winter. I'm beginning to feel alarmed at the tardiness of our movements, one member of the party, Edwin Bryant, wrote, and fearful that winter will find us in the snowy mountains of California. And perhaps because the pioneers left late, they decided to take a shortcut. Most wagon trains turned north and filed an arc through Iowa before looping back down to Nevada. But a guidebook author named Lansford Hastings suggested an alternate route, a shortcut that he called the Hastings Cutoff. However, Hastings had never actually explored his cutoff himself, and he had a less than stellar reputation when it came to doling out advice. In fact, one of James Reed's friends had specifically warned him to avoid the Hastings Cutoff. Don't take this shortcut, James Clyburn told Reed before the Donner Party had decided which route to take. Lansford Hastings doesn't know what he's talking about. He, in fact, has never taken this cutoff himself. I advise you strongly, don't take it. Stick to the known California trail. Don't take the shortcut that's going to save you time, because it won't. Bryant, who had since ridden ahead of the party, also sent word back to the rest of them, saying that the cutoff was all but non-existent and would be difficult for the Donner Party to navigate with their wagons. But the pioneers never got his message. So the Donner Party forged on to the Hastings cutoff and towards their doom. It didn't take long for the Donner Party to realize they'd made a grave mistake. They soon found that the Hastings Cutoff wasn't really a trail at all, which meant they had to hack one for themselves. Plus, the Cutoff took the party across the arid Great Salt Lake Desert, where many of them almost died of thirst. Worst of all, this so-called shortcut in fact added crucial days to the Donner Party's journey, ensuring that they'd lose their race against the coming of winter. As they began their final stretch through the Sierra Nevada mountains, snowflakes began to fall. They had just 100 miles to go, but the snow began to fall harder and faster. Before long, a blizzard roared and snowdrifts as tall as 25 feet piled up. The pioneers could neither go forward nor back. They were trapped. 
All I could see was snow everywhere, one survivor wrote. I shouted at the top of my voice. Suddenly, here and there, all about me, heads popped up through the snow. The scene was not unlike what one might imagine at the resurrection, when people rise up out of the earth. Had the party arrived even one day earlier, they might have made it through the mountain pass. Instead, the snow had sealed their fate, and they were forced to set up camp at Truckee Lake, where they hoped for the best. But their hopes quickly began to crumble under the weight of extreme hunger. During their long journey, the Donner Party had used up most of their rations. Now, trapped in the mountains, they ate anything they could. First, they killed the pack animals, their loyal oxen and horses who had pulled the wagons. After eating the meat, they sucked the bone marrow and tried to make an edible paste out of the hides. Next, they killed the field mice that darted through their camp. Once those were gone, the Donner Party was forced to kill and eat their pet dogs. With no animals left to consume, they started chewing on pine cones and tree bark, but things were getting increasingly desperate. People had grown weak and sick. Many died. But by this point, it dawned on the survivors that they had another possible food source right nearby, the bodies of their fellow pioneers who had already perished and been buried in the snow. To this day, it's hard to say exactly what happened at Truckee Lake when the food ran out. Some survivors never spoke about it ever again, but others confirmed in diaries and letters that they had indeed turned to cannibalism to survive. In one instance, a young woman mourning her brother's death looked out the window to see her fellow pioneers roasting his heart on a spit. In another, a woman mused out loud that she might commence upon one of her fellow dead pioneers' bodies and eat him. And when wolves began to sniff around the snowbound graves of the dead pioneers, one pioneer wrote in her diary, quote, Perhaps God sent the wolves to show Mrs. Murphy and also Mrs. Graves where to get sustenance for their dependent little ones. Was it culpable or cannibalistic to seek and use the only life-saving means left them? End quote. But perhaps one of the best recorded instances of cannibalism came in mid-December when a number of pioneers decided that they'd leave camp and try to find help. The so-called Forlorn Hope Party set out on December 16th, but soon resorted to cannibalism. By Christmas, they had run out of food. Though they discussed letting someone volunteer to die so the others could eat him, they ended up not having to go to such lengths as several members of the party then perished of hypothermia and starvation. Averting their faces from one another and weeping, the others quickly ate them. When that meat ran out, however, the men turned on the two Miwok Indians Luis and Salvador, who were traveling with the group, shot them and cannibalized them. These deaths represent one of the most horrifying aspects of the Donner Party saga and is believed to be the only time the pioneers directly killed someone in order to eat them. But despite such horrors, the Forlorn Hope's gambit worked. A few of the group did manage to get help and alert others to the tragedy unfolding in the Sierra Nevadas. Rescuing the Donner Party survivors was tricky, to say the least. They were scattered in different groups, and the harsh winter conditions made it difficult for the rescuers to reach them. So the rescuers came in four waves, known as reliefs. From February until April, the rescuers painstakingly shepherded survivors out of the mountains. Along with the survivors came the horror stories of what the rescuers had seen. One man described a revolting and appalling spectacle that included human skeletons and every variety of mutilation. Another account claimed to have seen children sitting upon a log with their faces stained with blood, devouring the half-roasted liver and heart of the father. This account went on to describe the hair, bones, skulls, and the fragments of half-consumed limbs around the fire. One survivor, Jean-Baptiste Trudeau, whom rescuers claimed to have come across holding a human leg, even outright admitted to cannibalism a few weeks later, though he later denied it. A naval lieutenant named H.A. Wise claimed that Trudeau admitted to eating Jacob Donner and his four-year-old son, quoting Trudeau as saying, Eat baby raw, stewed some of Jake, and roasted his head. Not good meat, tastes like sheep with the rot, but sir, very hungry, eat anything. And another seven-year-old Mary Donner tearfully admitted to seeing her little brothers cooked after they died, and later eating them. I could not help it, she's alleged to have said. I had eaten nothing for days, and I was afraid to die. Still, among these gruesome stories, one certainly stands out. 
The last person from the Donner Party to be rescued was a German immigrant named Louis Kesselberg. According to accounts from his rescuers, he was found with a cauldron of human flesh. Kesselberg's rescuers claimed that they offered him food, but he demurred, saying he'd come to prefer eating people. But Kesselberg's story, as well as many others from the Donner Party, had been picked up, sensationalized, and spread by newspapers and books published at that time. As such, it can be difficult to determine which stories are true, which are exaggerated, and which are outright fabrications. However, it does seem clear that at least 21 people were cannibalized by the members of the Donner Party. Aside from the two murdered Native Americans, the others were already dead before they were eaten. And almost two centuries later, the Donner Party continues to fascinate and horrify countless students of history, largely for that reason. But one historian of the Donner Party tragedy thinks they've been judged too harshly. What would you do? asked Michael Wallace, author of The Best Land Under Heaven, a detailed account of the Donner Party. What would you do if you were starving to death, freezing to death, and your children were around you, and you saw them, and they were dying, and you knew that the store of protein was there? What would you do? I know what I would do. So, Kit, what would you have done in this situation? (laughs) Well, it's hard to to say exactly. I mean, that's kind of, I think, part of the the thing that drives sort of the allure of the the Donner Party is you constantly have to question what would you do? Like, you have to make the choices that are you wouldn't have to make in everyday life. And I think it's hard for people to know 100 percent that they wouldn't decide to eat another human. I thought that would be a good segue into a book written by Michael Wallace, um, The Best Land Under Heaven, The Donner Party and the Age of Manifest Destiny. And it's about the Donner Party, but far less focused on the cannibalism Mm -hmm. and more about the circumstances that brought them there. Mm -hmm. Um, And he really stresses how cannibalism was a last ditch effort. The Donner Party did everything in their power to avoid cannibalizing each other. And even when they did, there were rules around it. They didn't kill someone to eat them. They ate people who were already dead. They tried not to eat their own family members. Yeah, I guess except for the uh, the two poor American Indians that were... Yeah, but the rules are always different in that case <laughs> yeah, on right. the American frontier. But I think it's important that we kind of take a step back mm-hmm. and talk about the choices and the mistakes that brought them here in the first place and dive a little deeper into that. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, if they had left a little bit earlier, I think we kind of emphasize that in the, the story, how the general rule of thumb was that you had to... Uh, you had to be by, at Independence Rock by uh, by July 4th, and uh, they got there about a week after, and so that, of course, put the pressure on them to uh, take the cutoff, but there were other people that had got to the sort of the fork in the road between the cutoff and not the cutoff and uh, around the same time as them, so even, even being late, if they had not taken the cutoff and just gone on the regular road, they would have made it fine like the other, uh, like the other parties. Yeah, it seems like they got a lot of misinformation Yeah, for sure. Do you think any of that misinformation seemed intentional? Well, definitely like Bryant's letter not being delivered was intentional by, there's like a small fort near the fork between taking the cutoff and not taking the fort. fort. This one is actually, Sutter's Fort's after um, the mountains. This one is, uh, shoot, what's it called? Bridger's Fort. So the fact that Sutter's Fort is out of the mountains makes those rescue missions and the missions for supplies even more insane just to think that they risk their lives to go out of the mountains and then go choose to go back into the mountains where people were just to save them but yeah bridger's fort there's these two businessmen there that basically because the the other the non-cutoff trail had become very popular and they were bypassing this this uh, trading post and so they wanted the cutoff to become more popular so that's why they they prevented bryant's letter from being delivered so that so that the the party would um, go by the trading post and then, you know, hopefully it would make this route more popular and wow and their <laughs> and their story would become more popular. But dying for visibility, yeah. for commercial visibility. Yeah, it seems like they were pretty well stocked for the journey, according to Michael Wallace, who wrote "The Best Land Under Heaven." Um, the party left with books and bottles of fine wine Mm. and James Reed who was one of the caravan leaders even had a feather bed and a cook stove in his wagon which was jokingly called the prairie palace (laughs) so they started out on the right foot for sure Um, what was the first thing that seemed to have gone wrong 
one thing that I found kind of interesting was how like they had like these 40 head of cattle with them, even as they were going into the Sierra Nevadas. But they, they ran into some hostile Indian tribes, the, the Paiutes, that uh, basically slaughtered all their cattle. So they, uh, like almost all of it at least. And so they, if they had just had that cattle with them, who knows what would have happened. Maybe they would have been able to, uh, to ration that out and uh, not have to resort to, to cannibalism. So I think that's a good segue into their relations with Native Americans. How else did that affect their journey? Well, there were a lot of Indians that they talked to on the way. A lot of Americans at that time had just heard stories about the uh, the savage Indians, the uh, the ones that would raid villages and um, kidnap children and that kind of thing. You know, the U.S.'s uh, relationship with Indians was pretty complicated. There was lots of friendly tribes or lots of unfriendly tribes. There were some tribes tribes that started out friendly, and then once they saw what the settlers were doing, became unfriendly. Like when all their buffalo were being killed. Yeah, I think there's a segment we either discuss in here or that I read elsewhere where um, frontiersmen were literally just shooting at Native Americans for target practice on their way. Mm, yeah, that one surprised me. I mean, obviously there were lots of different Americans too, ones that were ha- open to uh, being mm-hmm. friendly with Indians and then ones that ju- yeah just <laughs> were more interested in genocide and, and that kind of thing. And there were some, um, there were some relations with Native Americans that helped them on their journey. Um, we have we talked about the Miwoks. Do you want to say more about that? So the Miwoks were two instances of them meeting the Miwoks. The first is, of course, when uh, Luis and Salvador, the two Indians that were murdered in the Forlorn Hope Party, um, mm. they were part of the first rescue mission. Even before the the reliefs had started, it was uh, one of the uh, one of the settlers had made it out across the um, the summit by himself and was able to. Uh, get help from Sutter's Fort um, in the form of these two, partially in form of these two uh, Native American slaves, basically, that Sutter was keeping at his fort. And so, you know, obviously they were murdered. And then apparently two days later, the Forlorn Hope Party stumbles into a Miwok village where they're given food and aid and everything. So there's this contrast of like the settlers murdering murdering these two Indians and then immediately (laughs) going to them for help, the same, uh, the same tribe. So, yeah, there's sort of like an irony in the, the whole thing. <laughs> so, yeah, there were these, there's this tribe, uh, the Washus of, of Lake Tahoe, and um, there's some archaeological evidence that they had actually tried to help the settlers with, with food and, and that sort of thing. But, yeah, the settlers were so afraid of the Indians based on their experience with the Pay- Paiutes, and uh, apparently the settlers just, just ran them off. And so the, <laughs> even though they might have... If they had been able to make this connection with the, the Washus, they might have survived, but who knows? <laughs> Just a, another what if in this whole story, so many different ways. Oh, and what's one more what if that you think? Well, the last one, I right the day before the big snowstorm hit that trapped them, they were only three miles away from, from the summit of the mountain. And so once they, if they had been able to do those three miles that last day and hit the summit, they might've been able to go down the mountain instead of being trapped on the other side, where obviously going up the mountain is a lot harder than going down it. A lot of the settlers had asked for, or had pushed for them to, to keep going, but they were rebuffed and forced to make camp it. And so that yeah, was it. Yeah, it seems like they probably had broken spirits at that point. Yeah, well, I, I think they were, they were pretty tired. I mean, they had just, you know, they had pushed through that, the desert the, mm-hmm. by the Great Salt Lake and... It had been, I mean, there already people had started dying way before even the snow came. Like, And there was a murder, um, a yeah, murder right. and a half, I guess, technically. Um, James Reed, who was one of the leaders, mm-hmm. stabbed a teamster to death over a dispute. Right, yeah. Um, and he was briefly exiled from the group. And there was a, it wasn't exactly a murder, but there was an old man who was traveling with Louis Kessberg, who emerges as the kind of villain of the Donner Party. Yeah, Kessberg does, yeah. Kessberg. Um, and this old man was just pretty old and frail, and he was turned away by pretty much everyone in the caravan because he was so old and frail, and he was just kind mm-hmm. of a liability. Um, so he was basically left to die before they made it to the mountains. So I can imagine morale was pretty low yeah. between a murder, having to leave someone behind. I think there were a couple burials. Someone died of consumption. 
Yeah, there was like, was that, was that old guy the same one that two other settlers were like left there with him to help him out, but uh, they ended up just robbing him? <laughs> I, forget, oh, no. <laughs> I forget who that was. Oh no. And then they, bl- they blamed not. it on Indians, but. <laughs> oh man. Classic. But then uh, after a while, they, it was obvious that they had done it. <laughs> so we have definitely both stories of greed and cruel survivalist, cruel survivalism. Um, but then there's also moments where members of the party were really selfless. The first one I can think of is Tamzine Donner. Do you want to say more about that? Oh, yeah. Three times uh, they offered... She had a chance to, to leave the camp during right. the during, during the relief efforts, but she uh, she decided to stay with her dying husband and unfortunately ended up in uh, Kesselberg's cook pot or whatever. Yeah, that's <laughs> apparently she was found in his cauldron of doom or whatever, yeah. but unclear as to whether or not that really happened. Yeah, I'm sure she she did die. Like that's yeah. indisputable. But did he? I think the accusation was that Kesselberg killed her in order to eat her but yeah he, he, he just, always denied that he might have just cooked her after she was already dead yeah <laughs> which is what they were doing anyway which is what they were doing anyway but um that's also a good segue into how this was covered by newspapers at the time and mm-hmm. how what we know now might not be entirely accurate or somewhat sensationalized yeah i mean a lot of the, a lot of diaries were published i guess and it's not always clear which ones are true and like what's just completely made up so much leeway and, and you know time changes people's memories to make them more extreme and mm. uh, people say stuff to get attention after a while so it's uh i don't know was there anything you wanted to talk about in particular with the just how kesberg came oh, yeah. out as the how was the, the hannibal lecter of the donner <laughs> party um it was speculated that he precipitated the deaths of six of the weakest party members including mm. children um, and that he resorted to cannibalism first. And apparently there's some quote that says he preferred children to California beef. <laughs> but um, Kes- Kesberg has always denied this publicly and had denied he's no longer with us. Yeah. Um, but he <laughs> he sued the media outlets that printed this for slander. And he did win, but I think he only won like the equivalent of a dollar or something. Oh, yeah. R- something silly. Um <laughs> Uh, he died in 1895 at the age of 81, and almost every obituary that mentioned him also mentioned cannibalism in the same breath, which is a pretty horrifying legacy. Yeah, that's, especially that's when, rough. especially when you're already traumatized from having to do it in the first place. As um, if you didn't actually, you know, kill them right. all. Right. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of made out to sound like this cruel, really shrewd character. He left yeah. an old man. He attacked children. He supposedly killed Tamsin when she stayed with her husband. Yeah. Um, but I think Michael Wallace, the author we spoke about earlier, makes a good point. Like, what would you do? He was yeah. trying to survive. People are dying. Mm-hmm. And there's a source of protein. <laughs> that I know it's such like a forbidden protein like a really <laughs> a really clinical way of talking about a person's body a store of protein yeah is that all I am <laughs> and that quote about commencing upon someone is so funny yeah too. it's like what a weird way to describe eating a human <laughs> I guess it's easier to say it in formal terms than to say <laughs> tore into his flesh although we just said it so it's not it's not that hard <laughs> Oh, yeah. Another thing about the diaries that I found interesting is that Tamzine apparently kept a really detailed diary because she was she was actually planning on opening like a school, I guess, like when she got to California. And so she was like she was really into botany and was like recording all these plants and stuff and, and then recording what happened. But she's like the diary was sent to a relative, I think, and it, it like it was burned or like uh, there was a fire amongst all her stuff. And so it's been lost to time. So that, that's really I know it's kind of stuff like that where you could you could have learned what what actually happened, or at least another perspective on what actually happened. But it's just up in smoke. <laughs> Are there any other diaries that exist still? Well, the Patrick Breen one's oh. like the most uh, the most in depth one that exists. I think there were some other ones that people kept off and on, but he he wrote I think pretty much every day while he was alive. I don't know if he made it out. Most of the men didn't. So, I, but it's pretty detailed, um, I guess. Heart of Darkness vibe. 
Yeah, I don't know. That's what I got from Sutter because mm. he, uh, well, you know, he has like this kind of mini fiefdom that he set up. He was the first, like, first major trading post in the in California, and like he has all these slaves and supposedly like, you know, gave away young native women to his friends and stuff like that. Really, pretty messed up. But yeah, I mean, but although on the other hand, he does like help rescue all the um, the Donners. I mean, he tries a little bit at least. Yeah, but the Donners were white, so. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. that is an interesting point to bring up to the paradoxes that are always playing out on the American frontier. Yeah. It's a great opera. It presents itself as this great opportunity, but in the effort to manifest their destiny, yeah. they're genociding a native peoples. Yeah. And, and like there is this irony too, too, where they're doing that and they die in the process. Yeah. Yeah, there's the whole thing of like, oh, they're coming to, to civilize the West or whatever, mm-hmm. but they uh, they themselves are obviously not very civilized at the end. They're like descend into this kind of madness that, yeah, it's pretty. And it's then pretty if crazy. we're willing to look back on that madness with compassion and, and say, what else would you do? Then the whole term savage just means nothing. Yeah. And that's, I, I'm saying like, I think that's fair. You know, we shouldn't have gone in with that mindset anyway. Yeah. I found it really interesting when learning about the Darwin Party, just as like an example of just what the Western exploration was from start to finish, like how all the stuff they had, they had to bring and like how it was on the trail, stopping all the time and Mm -hmm. having to ford the river, (laughs) like stuff that you learn about from playing Oregon Trail for those that (laughs) did that. Um, Definitely an instance where not making history was probably for the best. You didn't want to go down (laughs) as a notorious party. No, it's better to have a quiet journey mm-hmm. to a quiet, easy journey. Little to the, house on the, the prairie West. style. <laughs> but yeah, to get back to sort of the civilization stuff, I think that's sort of the part of the horror of the whole Donner Party thing is just how close people really are from from like just totally devolving into cannibalism. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, these were people like like the Reeds and the Donners were friends with Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois. And, and actually Abraham Lincoln almost went on the trip with them. And, you know, they were these well-respected figures within Springfield, Illinois, but then, you know, quickly they just evolve into these, like, um, you know, the kind of people that leave others to die and feast upon the, their, uh, their corpses and (laughs) that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. You're always one snowstorm away from potentially eating your neighbor. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then like coming from that madness back into the sunlight, like down from the into the California spring, like how crazy that must have been. It's like all of a sudden, oh, I'm back in civilization and like, Mm -hmm. but I have this like horrible past and (laughs) that you have to live with forever. And like Kesselberg even follows him behind, beyond the grave kind of in the obituary. It is interesting that any, everyone who survived, or at least I don't know if this is true. Maybe we should look this up, but it seems like the people who survived went on to live fairly normal, well-adjusted, yeah, somewhat long lives. Kesberg was like 81. 90s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think the daughter maybe. The Donner's daughter survived, right? The I child? I think so, yeah. At least one of them. Uh, yeah, I, th- I read the, one, the last Donner Party survivor died in like the 1930s. <laughs> so uh, they must have been like very young, I guess, when because uh, they were in their 90s and the, the uh, Donner Party incident was in the like 47, I think, or 46 that winter. Maybe that's a good time to zoom out and say what else was happening around this time in 1847 in the winter. Uh, The Mexican War was underway. So any able-bodied men who would normally have been at Sutter's Fort or at any of these outposts along the way Mm -hmm. weren't there. They were all fighting or dead. Yeah, I guess that's another what if. What if the Mexican Mm -hmm. War hadn't started? (laughs) They have been able to... uh, to get help more quickly. What else was happening? But I mean, it's kind of interesting about the Mexican War too, that these settlers were going into Mexican territory. They weren't even trying to go to a U.S. state. They were just, I mean, I guess they all maybe had the idea that it would soon become a U.S. state. Like I'm sure the Mexican War was on the horizon, but it is interesting that they were, you know, they were actually just trying to go to Mexico. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But now you think of it as just going to California. I don't know. Another interesting thing is like Hastings after leading all these people onto the, his fake shortcut. <laughs> he eventually, uh, after the civil war, he went on to, uh, try to found 
a Confederate colony in Brazil, which uh, oh, right. I think we wrote a story about that. The Confeder- Los Confederados. <laughs> yeah, he was one of those to guys. To keep slavery alive. Yeah, so he was, uh, you know, kind of a piece of work. But um, yeah, that's where he died was in that Brazilian colony. So Surrounded by really, all the things he loved. <laughs> yeah, slavery, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, really, I guess he had a colorful life. Hmm. What, what's the Black Hawk War? Oh, the Black Hawk War is, um, that was a war in Illinois right before they left for, or like a few years, I guess, before the Donners left. But like the Donners and the Reeds and, and uh, actually Lincoln also was, they were all part of this, um, they're all fighting on this war from part of the Illinois group that fought in the war. Basically, it was like a, oh, an Indian war. Yeah, originally. That's right. That's where they originated. And that's how they knew Lincoln. That's how they knew Lincoln. Yeah, they're all in Springfield, the Illinois capital. So the Donners and the Reeds know Lincoln because they were all in Springfield. So it was really a small town back then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everyone knew everyone. Yeah, and I guess they were they were good friends, but good enough that Lincoln considered going on this trip, but Mary Todd told him not to, and instead he just wow. became senator <laughs> <laughs> and eventually president. I guess those were another two options, yeah. go west or become a senator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the end, 41 members of the Donner Party died, while 46 survived. The survivors did what it took to live through the ordeal. Many of them were children, so it was their parents' choice to give them human flesh to ensure that they'd make it to California. But of all the lessons learned by the Donner Party survivors, one certainly stands out. In a letter written to her cousin about what had happened in the Sierra Nevadas, Virginia Reed wrote, Remember, Never take no cutoffs and hurry along as fast as you can. If they hadn't made that fateful mistake months earlier, the Donner Party would likely have been one of the many wagon trains whose journey went so smoothly that its name and its story are all but forgotten today. Thanks for listening to History Uncovered. I'm History Uncovered's producer, Kit Westneat. If you like the show, help others find us by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And be sure to follow the All That's Interesting and History Revealed pages on Facebook and Real History Uncovered on Instagram. Make sure you don't miss out on the new episodes and subscribe to the History Uncovered podcast. And keep up with our latest stories at allthatsinteresting.com. If you have a question about the show or just want to say hi, feel free to call us at 929-526-3029 or email us at podcast at allthatsinteresting.com. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like Legends of the Old West and Redacted History. Until next time, keep exploring.